This is the third video in my series on the mathematics of epidemics and pandemics. In this video we're going to make some adjustments to the model that we built in the previous videos to work out how many people are going to be infected in a pandemic and when. In the previous videos I made some assumptions about the population and the disease. I've changed it slightly in this video to make it a bit simpler to model. So rather than assuming people are infectious for two weeks, I'm going to assume they're only infectious for one week. This means that in any given week, only the people that were infected in the previous week are going to be out there infecting other people. The person that infected those infectious people has now been removed from the disease. So the first question that we want to answer to work out how big and bad a pandemic is going to be is what is the chance that a particular infected person infects a particular infected person in a given week? So if Daniel has the disease and Elijah doesn't, what's the chance that Daniel infects Elijah? As in the previous videos, there's two questions we have to answer. The first one is, will the infected person interact with the uninfected person? Daniel is only going to interact with 10% of the population. Is Elijah in that 10% that he interacts with? And secondly, will the interaction between Daniel and Elijah result in Daniel giving Elijah the infection? Well, it only will in 5% of such interactions, on average. So let's say that Daniel interacts with 10% of the uninfected population in a week, so that's 40 people in our population of 401. And on average, they infect 5% of these 40 people. So that's two people that they're infecting. So we know that on average, Daniel is going to infect two other people. What's the chance that Elijah is one of these two people? So we can calculate this as the number of people that the infected person infects on average, so two people, divided by the total number of people they could possibly infect. 400 people. So the chance of Elijah being infected by Daniel is 0.5%. As we said in the first video, the outcome of an interaction between an infected and a non-infected person is a bit like tossing a coin. Either the infection is going to be transferred or it's not going to be transferred. So if the chance of any particular susceptible person being infected by a particular infectious person in a given week is 0.5%, then the chance of any given susceptible person not being infected by a particular infectious person in a given week is 100% minus 0.5%, which is 99.5%. Here's step by step who these 398 people who on average won't get infected are. So 360 people won't interact with the infectious person, and then of the 40 people that do interact with the infectious person, 38 will avoid infection. So of the 400 people that were at risk, 398 of them won't be infected, which is 99.5% of the population. This is easy enough to calculate in the first week of the pandemic, when there's just Daniel and Elijah. But what about after the first week of the pandemic, when there are multiple infectious people that any susceptible person can catch the infection from? Elijah can't just catch it from Daniel now, he could also catch it from Barry and Craig and John. How can we calculate the probability that a given person avoids infection when there are multiple infectious people? So, let's set the scene. During week one, our first patient infected two people. So, at the start of week two, we've got two infectious people. But because the disease only lasts for a week, our infectious person from week one is no longer infectious. So we have two infectious people and one person removed from the population. So... If you're one of the 398 uninfected people at the start of week two, what's the chance of you avoiding being infected by either Anne or Bob, our two infectious people, during week two? So, will Anne infect you? Chances she's going to infect you are 0.5%, quite unlikely. The chances that she won't infect you, 99.5%. Okay, so you've interacted with Anne. Now what about Bob? Well, will Bob infect you? If you were infected by Anne, we don't really care whether Bob infects you again or not. If you weren't infected by Anne, which will be true in 99.5% of cases, then we do care. And exactly the same as with Anne, Bob will infect you just 0.5% of the time, and won't infect you 99.5% of the time. So when we're thinking about the probability that a given person avoids infection, there's one path that we care about, and that's the path that Anne didn't infect you and Bob didn't infect you. So, 99.5% of the time, you'll avoid being infected by Anne, and if you've avoided being infected by Anne, then 99.5% of the time, you'll also avoid being infected by Bob. So 99.5% of 99.5% can be calculated as 99.5% times 99.5%, which is roughly 99%. So, what's the probability that a given person avoids infection? 
We know that it varies with the number of infected people. So when there's one infected person, the probability that you avoid infection is 99.5%. When there are two infected people, it's 99.5% times 99.5%. And so the pattern continues. When there's four infected people, it's 99.5 times 99.5 times 99.5 times 99.5 again. Week four with eight people, I'm not going to make you listen to me reading it out. Here I've done the calculations for you, and as you can see, as the number of infected people rises, the probability that any given person avoids infection goes down. This should make intuitive sense. You're more likely to catch a disease if more people have it, because more people have it, more people can give it to you. Here are the probabilities getting projected out even further, up to about week 8. We can see that the number of infected people is still growing, and so the probability that you avoid infection is falling. So if I want to draw out a pandemic going forward, I need to know the volume of people in all three groups. I need to know which individuals have not yet been infected with the disease, which individuals have got the disease and can pass it on, and which individuals have had the disease and have been removed from the disease. And I need to know all of these across all points in time. So the first question I'm going to answer is how many people do we expect to avoid infection in any given week? And to calculate this, we need to know both how many people are susceptible to being infected, so how many people could have been infected in the week, and the probability that any particular susceptible person manages to avoid being infected during the week. To explain what we mean here, if 100 people are susceptible to being infected in a week, and the probability that any individual susceptible person manages to avoid being infected is 60%, then we expect 60 people to avoid infection that week. Let's apply the same logic to our pandemic. And here we can plug in the numbers we calculated earlier for the probability that an individual avoids infection that week. So in week one, we had 400 uninfected people because we only had one person with the disease. We calculated before that the probability that they avoid infection is 99.5%. So the number that we expect to avoid infection in the week is 99.5% of 400, which is 398. This makes sense because it suggests that two people didn't avoid infection, which is what we calculated before. So, at the start of week two, the expected number of uninfected people is the number of people that avoided infection in the previous week. So that's 398. We calculated before that when two people have the disease, the probability that any individual avoids infection is 99%. 99% of 398 is 394. So during week two, we expect 394 people to avoid infection. You can obviously repeat this calculation over and over, so for weeks 3 and 4 here. And here I've done it all the way out to week 8. And you can see that as the probability that you avoid infection falls, so does the expected number of people that avoid infection in the week. Great, so now we know at any point in time how many individuals have not yet been infected with the disease. The next question is clearly how many people do we expect to be infected in any given week? So, in any given week there's a group of people susceptible to infection, they're either going to be infected or not. In the last stage, we calculated how many of these susceptible people we expected to avoid being infected. So the number that we expect to be infected in any given week is simply the total number of susceptible people minus the number of susceptible people that avoided being infected, what we just calculated. So we've calculated the number that we expect to be infected as the susceptible people, 400, minus the people that avoided infection, 398. So, in week 1, we expected 2 people to be infected. Exactly the same calculation again in week 2. 398 susceptible people, 394 avoidance. So that leaves us with 4 people that we expect to be infected in the week. Here's the 4-week view, and you can see that the expected number that we think are going to get infected is growing quite steeply week on week. And here's the 8-week view. We can see it's quite steep growth, but starting to level out by about week 8. So, at any point in time, we now know how many individuals have not yet been infected with the disease, have avoided being infected, and how many individuals have been infected with the disease and so are able to pass it on. Because we've chosen a very simple model, with infected only being infectious for one week, we know there's only three groups in the population. Those who have avoided infection during the week, those who have been infected during the week, and we know the volumes of each of those, and then the third group, which is those who have been removed from the disease. This could be people that were infectious during the week and perhaps infected other people and have now got over it, or people that were infectious weeks and weeks back and haven't been infectious for a while. So, we can calculate the number of removed people at the end of the week by simply taking away 
all of the people who avoided infection and all of the people who were infected from the total population. Let's see this in practice. Total population is still 401. We know that we expected 398 people to avoid infection during the week, so 401 minus 398 is 3. Of those three people, we actually expected two to get infected, so that leaves one person left, and one person is what we expected to be removed at the end of the week, given that they were infectious at the start of the week and the infection only lasts a week. Here we can see the expected number of removed over time out to week four. Clearly it's growing over time, as week on week more people are infected, therefore a week later, more people are going to be removed. Here we can see this projected out to week 8, and by week 8 we can see that about 40% of the population have already had the disease and have been removed from it. So, now we know the volumes of people across time in all three groups, we can map out the pandemic. So, based on our simple model and the assumptions on the right hand side, this is what the pandemic looks like. We can see that the pandemic starts quite slowly with very few infected people in the early weeks. And then suddenly, there's quite a steep, sharp drop in the number of uninfected, susceptible people. This starts to flatten out as more of the population are removed from the pandemic, so can't contribute to the spread and can't be given the disease. This pandemic is actually over by week 16. So, during this pandemic, how many people were infected? We can calculate this by looking at the end of the pandemic, so any time after about week 15, 16. We can look at the number of people that have been removed from the infection, and this is the number of people that had the infection at some point. Here, 321 people are removed by week 16, so that's 80% of the population. Whereas at the bottom, you can see 80 people still in orange, so these are people who are uninfected to this day. They avoided getting the infection. This is very interesting, but perhaps what's more interesting, and for sure more useful for policymakers, is comparing the shape and size of pandemics under different assumptions, such as if there's different interaction levels within a population, or different levels of disease infectiousness. Here, I've changed the percentage of the population that the average person interacts with in any given week. I've reduced it from 10% to 8%. We can see quite a difference in the shape of the graph and in the total number of people infected by the pandemic. So on the left hand side, in our base case from before, 80% of the population was infected at some point during the pandemic, versus on the right hand side, when we've got fewer interactions, we've got far fewer people infected. In fact, only 260 people are infected in this pandemic, which is 65% of the population, a lot less. The second thing I changed in my model was the infectiousness of the disease. Here we can see that a small increase in the infectiousness of the disease has a huge impact. Look at the shape of the graph on the left and the graph on the right. It's much deeper on the right, with much more of the population being infected. In fact, by the end of the pandemic with the more infectious disease, 93% of the population has been infected. This was just a simple model of a pandemic, but mathematicians have built out so many more vastly more complex and realistic models of the spread of pandemics. And these models are so useful because they tell us the extent to which of changes in various factors, including those within our control, like behavioral changes, affect the spread of pandemics. And this in turn affects both how many people are infected with the disease and whether the infections are concentrated within a short period of time or spread out over far longer. And both of these factors impact how well our healthcare systems are able to cope with the pandemic and therefore the likely cost to human life. I'm going to take a minute to look at the second critical feature of pandemics that I've outlined there. So this is whether the infections are concentrated in a short period of time or spread out over longer. Let's look at the peak infection point. In our base case, 62 people were infected during week 9. However, when we reduced the number of interactions that people had, the peak was much smaller, only 34 people, and later, week 11. Having fewer people infected later is super helpful. Fewer people means that we're more likely to have the health resources available to treat them, and having it later means that we've had time to collect more resources. Compare this to our more infectious disease, which infected 109 people in week 7. That's going to put huge pressure on healthcare systems. Another likely quite familiar way that you can show this is on a line graph. Here, I've just shown the number of infected people at any point in time. The green line in the middle is our base case. Compare this to the quick, sharp peak of the infectious disease, or compare it to the flatter blue line, 
which looks at the situation when people interact less. The impact of this on our healthcare systems is very significant, which explains why many countries worldwide have introduced social distancing measures in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Beyond being interesting from an academic perspective, mathematical models of pandemics also tell us how simple changes in our behaviours can have an impact on the spread of pandemics. In the first video, we said that the chance of an infected person infecting an uninfected person depended on two things, whether or not they interacted, and whether or not within that interaction the infection was spread. So, how can we change the spread of pandemics? We can reduce the number of interactions we have, avoiding mass gatherings, public transport, etc. And we can reduce the risk of passing on or catching the disease within any given interaction. So even if we're interacting with a person, we can reduce our risk. So stop greeting people with handshakes or a hug. And wash our hands well before and after any given interaction. This is clearly stating the obvious, but what we've seen from these videos is that these small measures, if we all do them, can have a big impact on the spread of pandemics. Whereas hoarding toilet paper is probably not going to save anyone.